So before I begin, I'm going to ask you an extremely important question. Are you with Libya Dignity? Or are you with Libya Dawn? I'm not surprised by your silence. Now, I know these may just seem like names in this room, probably irrelevant names. But in Libya, where I live and work daily, it is akin to asking, should you live or should you die? In different parts of the country, regardless of what you answer, there's a 50% chance you are going to be wrong. Now, Libya is not unique. Our global strategy in war is to vilify and dehumanize our opponents. It's us versus them, good versus evil. We make it almost impossible to find any common ground, and ultimately impossible for sustainable peace. The underlying nuances of conflict, corruption, unemployment, poverty, completely worthless security and political systems are neglected. And we focus on these polarizing aspects. But you know who knows those underlying nuances very well? Women. The local population. And we drown out their voices because we're too busy bombing them. Now, I was born and raised in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. And I'm going to give you all a minute to find that on your mental map. <laughs> in Canada, the closest I ever got to war was on my television, on my sofa, watching my TV. I didn't really have much of an understanding. I could always pause. I could always walk away. I moved back to Libya in 2005. In the early 2000s, the Libyan regime reopened the doors to Libyans living abroad. No fear of persecution, they promised. I was 15, I had just finished medical school, and I had been taken from Saskatoon, which granted is the middle of nowhere, to my parents' hometown, Zawiya, Libya, which is also the middle of nowhere. Zawiya is rooted in tradition. And it was there where I began to understand the importance of local ownership. I was extremely interested in the tr intricate tribal and familial history. I thought it was amazing. And here is where I'm going to add a disclaimer. A lot of media and many people will tell you the war in Libya is about tribe or religion. I have to disagree. Tribe and religion are identifiers. They're strategies in war. Usually they're weapons in war, and they've been used as such. But when we isolate them as the only issues we're gonna focus on, we forget the rest of the conversation. And we allow for that conflict to prolong. In 2011, in my final year of medical school, those images of war that I used to see only in movies became a daily reality. I couldn't pause and take a snack break. I couldn't turn down the volume. Basic necessities, electricity, cell phone coverage, baby formula, a safe route for your kids to go to school, those became contested. And my personal definition of security changed. And I wasn't alone. Those sentiments were shared by all the women I knew. Women who felt like they had genuine concerns that nobody was talking about. In my voice, the, the organization I founded, The Voice of Libyan Women, went to over 35 cities. We've conducted numerous projects. And one comment that has stuck with me since late 2011 is a comment from a grandmother in the mountain town of Jadu. I want you to imagine that you're in the passenger seat of a car. I want you to imagine that that car is picking up speed, 120, 
140, 160. It's going so quick that you cannot see what is happening from your passenger window. You cannot make out the images. You ask the driver to slow down and they tell you confidently, don't worry about this, I know what I'm doing. And you press on the imaginary brake and you hold on to the door, praying and negotiating that you make it home safely. She told me that feeling was how she felt every morning when her son left the house with a gun. He was confident, he was sure. And she would stand by the door, negotiating and praying for him to come home safely, for nobody else to come into her door. That is being a woman in war. You share all of the risk, and you have none of the control. Comments like hers and thousands of others from across the country inspired my organization to start the Noor campaign. And Noor, in its symbolic translation from Arabic, means the enlightenment of an individual, from a place of darkness and misunderstanding to a place of knowledge and awareness. We felt like it was a very smart choice for a conversation about security, women's participation, domestic violence, you name it. Obviously, some people disagreed. Um, one member, very high in, in government, actually told me that women lack the necessary inherent mental capacities to have a voice in security. Another high up security official told me, women don't know how to pick up a gun, so how will they know to put it down? Fair. Another told me, women just don't understand the realities of war. And somebody who I actually counted as a close friend, a young member of parliament who I saw as an ally in women's participation said, we just cannot have women at the table. Get it out of your head. We just can't. To which my response was, because it would work? I don't know. And to my surprise, the international community silently reinforced this. Despite the lip service they paid, they barely had women at the table. They were completely underrepresented. And this didn't go unnoticed by the local population, which when they were asked, where are your women, would respond, well, where are yours? And again, Libya is not unique. Globally, in international conflict, the international communities will say, we've been dedicated to peace. It's the local population that isn't. So the Nur campaign set out to prove that they were talking to the wrong locals. Rather than talk to those who are bombing the schools, let's talk to those who are pulling the children out of the rubble. City teams in 35 cities across Libya, led by women, 600 people from all walks of life, some who had never been involved in civil society before, some former ministers, through television and radio, through seminars and schools and mosques and universities and homes, spoke about security and conflict, the importance of unity, the largest campaign and most widespread campaign ever conducted in the country was inspired and led by women. And we didn't pick up a single gun. We approached ministries to ensure we could have access to public places. We approached the highest religious council, something unheard of for a women's rights organization, because we knew that without their approval of our religious scripture, we wouldn't be allowed into a lot of communities. Many people would claim that we were using manipulated information for our own benefit. And again, Libya is not unique. In conflicts around the world, due to rising extremism, due to foreign occupation, fatal disease, extractive corporations, in Palestine, in Liberia, in Guatemala, in the migrant boats fleeing from insecurity in their own countries, it is women who are the agents of change on the ground. Through their community credibility, their personal networks, their resources, through their determination to wage peace against all odds. To this day in Libya, it is women who are saying, it does not matter if you are Libya Dignity or if you are with Libya, Libya Dawn. What matters is that you identify as being Libyan. 
They are amplifying the call for unity. Now I know a lot of you probably think I'm all unicorns and rainbows. A general once told me I was asking him to hug the guy with the grenade in his hand. And I'm not. That would be silly. The only thing sillier is trying to bomb the grenade out of his hand. It makes a much bigger mess. The only way to get that bomb, that grenade, that gun put down permanently and safely is for us to fill that head in those hands with something else. A pencil, a paycheck, a diploma, a dream. It's the very essence of this forum. And it's something that we all have a hand in. When we go into conflicts, we can say, we need to listen. We need to listen to local communities. We need to listen to women. And we cannot listen if we are too busy bombing them. Thank you.